hopefully by now we have um, a little bit of a context for the practice we're doing together here and uh, hopefully some insights into why it's important to have at least a preliminary amount of wisdom before we begin the practice, especially that wisdom into um, the way all beings suffer. And as the Buddha said, recoil from pain and uh, desire and seek their own happiness. So recognizing that, you know, we can dedicate the blessings of our lives and practice to others and have a really good motivation with which to start the practice. And obviously through having some appreciation of the Buddha's teachings, this is supposed to uh, help cultivate faith or confidence. I actually like the word inspired confidence in the teachings so that again we get some energy, we get some motivation to put them into practice because it's one thing hearing the teachings and their potential and it's another thing actually starting to taste some of the happiness that comes through developing our minds. And so that confidence hopefully uh, motivates us to live good lives that are for the benefit of others as well as ourselves. And I know that, you know, I'm speaking to people here who do have really, really good uh, virtue, really, really good conduct in their lives. And uh, sure, we can do better, um, but that's no reason to beat ourselves. The whole purpose of the practice we just did was to encourage ourselves you know, by reflecting on how it feels when we do tap into the goodness in our hearts, even if, you know, it's not reached its potential, but at least it's there as a seed, at least it's there as an intention. And I used to really take a lot of um, solace from that as a quite uh, rebellious teenager, <laughs> you know, who was probably not always as nice to my parents as uh, I try to be now. Even now I often fail. <laughs> So that's a fact that, you know, if you are, what do they say? If you think you're enlightened, go home to your parents. So <laughs> that proves I'm not. Um, but one thing I always used to recognize was that my intention was good, you know, and I really didn't mean to cause harm. I just had to explore and had to push against the boundaries a bit. But that really stayed with me most of my life, like understanding my intention was good. And I think uh, Venerable Upeka shared a story as well from uh, her life about somebody she knows who's um, actually in prison and um, it's quite a harsh place to be, right? And sometimes this person gets kind of called up, you know, to come and, I don't know, for what re whatever reason, to be admonished or maybe moved to a, a worse facility. And they always remember in their mind, okay, almost spontaneously, like, I haven't actually done anything wrong. I've been good, I've been well behaved. And again, this gives them confidence, you know, in that situation. So sometimes it can happen naturally, especially if we practice. You know, the more we practice it, the more easily it will come to our minds and give us that faith. So faith isn't only in something external, but it starts to be inside our own heart. And then, of course, this, uh, this confidence and also the virtue that we practice gives us a sense of joy. And again, this is the whole purpose of the Buddha's path. It's to bring us out of suffering and towards ever-increasing happiness. And the Buddha did say that there are some happinesses, the happiness of virtue being one, that are not to be feared, that are to be praised, cultivated, and developed, made much of. And so this path is supposed to be a happy path. Yeah? So when we have even this preliminary level of happiness, you know, being able to go to bed at night without a guilty conscience, feeling that we've done our best, there's a kind of um, lack of remorse and a lack of um, guilt and other kinds of suffering in the mind. So we already have a certain amount of joy. And this gives us a head start in the breath meditation. So I'm going to go into that in more detail during this talk. But um, the happiness part of breath meditation is a pivotal point in our practice from where the breath and the, the, the calm, the still states of mind really start to deepen and, and, um, and become new sources of happiness, a more reliable happiness for the heart. Um, and I think for myself anyway, in the beginning years, or even actually probably in the first seven, eight, nine years of practice, uh, starting in the 90s, 
my breath meditation was a drag. It was a dragging it back in, dragging it back in again and again. And I was kind of relieved when the practice switched to like body contemplation because I found it much more interesting. There was more to work with. And the breath meditation didn't give me that much joy. Um, and so it never really went very deep. And I was always kind of relieved to move on to um, more of an, a wisdom practice. And it was years later, really, that I realized how important that joy was and how little it had been emphasized in that tradition. You know, it was all about kind of, and I really have a lot of gratitude to my first teachers, but it was very much on sort of fighting your own battles and kind of struggling your way out of suffering and sitting for long, long hours, no matter you know, how much pain was in the knees. And uh, it took a lot of reconditioning to realize meditation. You know, there's a certain kind of happiness that's allowed and even encouraged in the practice. So, um, yeah, with all these foundations, you know, our breath meditation and our samadhi is much stronger. And the Buddha actually said that um, it's the samadhi based on virtue. He called it sila paribhavito samadhi. Um, is of great fruit and great benefit. Mahapalo, Mahanisamso. So the samadhi, the calm, the stillness, if you really want to call it concentration, you can. Uh, it's a bad word, bad translation. Um, but the stillness that's born or based on sila, on virtue, is of great fruit and great mm -hmm. benefit. So it's this that can actually liberate. And, you know, looking on the converse side, of course, um, the sila that doesn't, sorry, the, the stillness or the, or the calm of the mind that doesn't have that samadhi, by contrast, is very weak and flimsy and not really a stable, reliable source of real freedom. So why is that? So I think the most obvious reason is because we're still harming ourselves and others, right? When we do anything, any act of body or speech, never mind the mind, but body or speech in particular, that harms and hurts ourselves or others, then obviously we're not really coming out of suffering at the deeper level. And I think there's also a danger in kind of uh, embellishing the ego, you know, if we come at meditation as kind of something to um, polish up our ego, you know, something to attain. Um, and of course, there's, there's more likely to be that greed in the mind for attainments if we don't have the happiness of virtue, the happiness of letting go. My teacher Ajahn Brahm uh, said to me the other day, I asked him specifically, like, why is the virtue so key? And he said it's the first step of letting go. You know, the first real kind of step of sometimes putting aside what we want to do the right thing, you know. We can often talk about things like abstaining from killing or stealing and sexual misconduct, which hopefully are quite uh, natural to most of us, I, I hope. But there are also things like being reliable, uh, doing what you say you'll do, being somebody who's true to their word, you know, being somebody who arrives at the time they say they'll arrive, for example. And in that, say, in that way, really put our minds at ease. And that does sorry, involve a little bit of relinquishment, right? Because something else might come up on the way, or maybe you've agreed to do something with someone and then something better comes up. And you say, no, you know, I'd really love to do that, but I already committed some to something else. So there's relinquishment involved in living a really virtuous life. And this helps to uh, cultivate that right attitude to meditation. Because sometimes you do hear in, in meditation circles talks of attainments, you know, and what stage this person's at and how many jhanas this person's supposed to have. Or you go on retreats that are literally called jhana retreats, like this is what you're going to get <laughs> if you pay your registration fee. And, uh, and to me, as uh, I don't know, I guess somebody who's learning that the path is about letting go, it, it sounds quite distasteful. Um, to talk in those terms because that's really we're on this path to become humble to disappear to let go of that sense of self not to embellish it with so-called spiritual a spiritual self yeah and I had a friend many years ago who um, 
obviously had some issues from the past. And I remember her saying to me after many years of practice and quite a lot of um, anger was coming up, she said to me that um, she was practicing to avoid herself, in fact, to transcend herself because she hated herself. And I realized, wow, you know, this, this is what can happen if we're not coming from those motives of loving kindness and compassion. We're just trying to get a kind of new self in a way um, because we don't like the one we have, the one we mistakenly think we have. <laughs> so, um, so it's very important, you know, to see that the path is going towards dissolving that ego. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that it's so important to have, um, to check that the practice is going in that way is because it's only really a humble mind that can be a mind of faith and confidence in something more. Yeah, so it's that humble mind, that soft mind of faith that is able to receive the breath, that's able to receive the wisdom of a teacher or of the Buddha and really allow it to soak into the mind. <clears throat> and a virtuous mind is a lot more simple than an unvirtuous mind. So when we live a life of virtue, it kind of declutters the mind. We don't have so much regret and remorse. You know, we start to get a taste for simplicity, uh, for contentment, and all those beautiful qualities that can really help us see the beauty in the breath. And of course, it brings up that joy. And when we have some joy in the mind, it becomes a lot easier to see the beauty in the breath. So instead of it simply being a, you know, this thing that you're trying to control and drag into the mind, it becomes something very lovely, very pleasing and um, soothing to the mind. Yeah? So this is how the wisdom, the faith, the virtue, and the joy can be a preparation for breath meditation. It softens the mind. Yeah? So this is part of the preliminaries uh, that the Buddha talks about in the first stages of the Eightfold Path. But he also talks about preliminaries to breath meditation itself. And some of those preliminaries are from the Satipatthana Sutta. So I don't know how much you remember from the morning's talk, but uh, I said there that the Buddha said that one who completes or develops breath meditation also completes the four satipatthanas, yeah, the four foundations of mindfulness. So one can understand the whole realm of body and mind, um, and in particular, not take it as anything belonging or um, being possessed by a self. Yeah? And uh, we also have to be aware of kind of how um, we need to develop that mindfulness in the beginning. So breath meditation is actually part of mindfulness of the body. So mindfulness of the body can start off with being mindful of the physical body. And part of that is um, learning how to treat the body well. You know, just learning um, that this body is not our slave. This body is actually a very precious vehicle for realizing the truth, for practicing the path. You know, we can actually understand the nature of the world through looking at the nature of our body. And so we learn to treat it well, which means giving it enough rest, feeding it with nourishing food, not to indulge the senses, but just to, to bring a sense of balance to the digestive system and you know, a sense of health and strength to the body. And then, of course, sitting down comfortably as well. And then gradually we learn to see the breath as a more refined aspect of the body. So we might start with awareness of the whole body. But eventually, um, the Buddha actually said that the breath is like a body among the bodies. In other places, he called it like the body of the breath. Um, which means that it's an aspect of the body. And it's a much more refined aspect. So in order to get on to something refined, we have to start with something a little coarser. <laughs> Hence, in the beginning of my practice, you know, it was too difficult to go straight to the breath. I used to work much more with the physical body. And only later I realized, oh, now it's time to go to the breath. You know, it's almost the opposite way around that I'd learned it. And that was really a relief because what I'd been doing with the mindfulness of the body was establishing 
a generalized kind of mindfulness, which really helped me in my daily life to understand, you know, the purpose of what I was doing, you know, to know when I was sitting, when I was walking, when I was eating, and to see that, you know, the body was changing all the time. The sensations in the body were changing all the time and to learn to be less reactive to that. And only after a lot of training in that was I ready to watch the breath. The other reason for that from the Satipatthana Sutta is a little phrase that says one should practice the Satipatthana, including breath meditation, um, having restrained the five hindrances, vinaya loke abhijja dhomanasam, which literally means having restrained craving and ill will for the world, which means for all experience. Okay, having restrained, so it doesn't mean you've completely abandoned the hindrances, but it does mean some preliminary work has to have been done, right? So we can, if we have a very strong mind that can get into deep meditation, deep samadhi quite easily, when we practice Satipatthana based on that, it will be extremely powerful. For most of us, we practice Satipatthana before we have such deep meditation. But even there, you know, it's important to restrain those hindrances first of all. So again, we've done that through the practice of virtue, uh, through the practice of loving kindness in particular, which really is the most powerful antidote to ill will. Not only to ill will, but to fear as well. And um, I don't know about people here, I'm imagining it's the same, that you're kind of generalized example of the people, I don't know, that come to meditation retreats. But uh, throughout the corona pandemic in particular, I noticed that on the application forms for our online retreats, in the past, probably 20 or 30% of people said they had anxiety or depression or both. And during the corona pandemic, it went up to like 80% of people who would apply. It was really striking and not surprising either, right? So much isolation, so much kind of being by ourselves with a lot of uncertainty, maybe economic difficulties, emotional difficulties, loneliness, etc. And, you know, depression and anxiety in particular would be particularly amenable to loving kindness meditation. Not to get rid of these things, but to really embrace and be with those emotions, those states. And I'm not saying here at all that that's always enough or that medication or other kinds of psychological help aren't important because I think if we can, you know, if we have the privilege to be able to uh, access all kinds of support, that's ideal. But the meditation on metta really helps with anxiety, with fear, um, just by big, giving it a bigger container, allowing it to be, you know, and developing a good attitude towards it so that we're not adding fear to the fear. <laughs> You know, or with the anger, we're not adding anger. We're not angry with being angry. But instead we can, you know, contact that unpleasant feeling, that anger that's in the heart and, and maybe develop some compassion. <laughs> maybe realize there's a layer of sadness there that actually needs our tender care rather than kind of being driven out of the mind. So having restrained the five hindrances will really, really help when it comes to breath meditation. And again, that metta practice is such a vital part of that. It also brings a lot of joy to the mind. And then the Buddha says, after we've uh, established those preliminaries, we go and find a comfortable place. Yeah, we find a comfortable place to sit. So if you haven't found one here yet, please find one. <laughs> I really hope it's comfortable for everyone here. Um, because even the Buddha used like a little grass cushion. He made sort of a grass thing to sit on under the Bodhi tree. It's not like he had big roots sticking out, sticking into his bum. And, uh, you know, he'd realize the, uh, the pitfalls of austerities by becoming so thin that apparently he could touch his tummy and feel his spine. And uh, it was impossible to meditate that way. So it was actually on the basis of having been offered a, a meal of delicious milk rice called kheer, I think, in modern day India, uh, that he sat down under the Bodhi tree on his cushion and meditated on the breath. So we go to a secluded place. We have that happiness of blamelessness. We have a sense of, yeah, you know, being basically ready for the work. And then we establish mindfulness. 
So again, before the breath meditation, we establish mindfulness first of all. So it's not that the breath meditation, you know, is the mindfulness practice or is the object of mindfulness straight away, but we've already established mindfulness in our daily life, in our activities, what we're doing and why, maybe in observing the body at the coarser level. And with this mindfulness established, we become aware of the breath. Yeah. So there's a difference there with kind of going after the breath to become mindful or having a certain amount of mindfulness that is the right kind, that is soft, that is with metta rather than ill will, yeah, that keeps those unwholesome states out. It has to be this wise kind of mindfulness. And then we can, as it were, sit back in that loving awareness and allow the breath into the mind, yeah? It's a much more receptive practice than the idea of going out and grabbing that breath. So we're actually sitting in, in, if you like, in our own goodness, yeah? We're sitting in this sense of warmth and acceptance, even benevolence towards whatever arises. And when the mind is calm enough, when the mind starts to notice things like silence, and it starts to be able to remain more present instead of being dragged to the future and the past, then naturally we start to notice the breath, especially if we've had instructions which can uh, brainwash us, or if you like, or suggest to us that the breath is something beautiful to watch. So we sit down comfortably and we allow the breath in. And it reminds me, I remembered uh, a nice simile for this, which was when I was at a Gaia house quite a few years ago now. And I was on retreat there and saw that in the fridge for the personal retreatants, there were some knots. So this is my confession. (laughs) And uh, I thought, well, there's loads of knots, so I'm sure I can give a few to the birds. Uh, That's the confession. (laughs) And uh, so on my windowsill, I just would put out some knots. And at first it was just the blue tits and the robins would come. But then all these really cute little birds like wrens and um, hmm, I forget the names, but different types of wrens and finches and even something really unusual with a kind of long beak. And it was tiny, gray, I think, really, really cute. And quite unusual, the shyest of the birds would come along because they started to feel safe. Bit by bit they noticed they can come and take the knots and no one's going to harm them. And in the beginning I used to sort of stand kind of quite hidden at the side with the windows closed so they couldn't see me, but if my shadow came across some of the shy birds would run away. But after a while I could like stand in the window and they'd still come along. And then I started to open the window and put my hand out with the knots. And uh, It was the blue tits that came first. And uh, they, in the beginning, would take any knot from my hand because they were just like, quick, (laughs) anything will do. And then after a while, um, they got so audacious that if it wasn't their favorite knot, cashew knot, (laughs) they'd give me a little peck (laughs) as if to say, come on, you know know what we like best. Give it. (laughs) Give us the cashew. (laughs) So then I'd stand there with my hand out for the for the blue tits, only with cashews. And after a while, you know, other birds would also eat off my hand, maybe not the really shy ones. But eventually, one day I went back to my room and I'd left the window open and I couldn't believe it, but on my chair in the middle of the room near the bed was a bird right inside the room. So it had come through the window and was just waiting to see what would happen there. And it became a little bit of a simile for me with the mind. It's like, or or with the breath. You can imagine those birds, almost like your breath. You know, not really sure that your mind's a friendly place for it to come. Or you're going to actually, like, grab it or throttle it by the neck. (laughs) But after a while, once it realizes, oh, yeah, in this place there are, there's kindness, there are even treats, there are things that taste delicious, like metta and... Uh, mudita and gratitude, then the breath starts to come in very shyly at first, but after a while it comes right in to the center of your mind, you know, because it feels safe with you, it feels at ease there. And so it's because we've created a nice environment 
for that breath to come in. So I really like this because, again, it just shows that it's all about the quality of the mind and not about any sort of force or ill will or um, kind of grasping or striving, but it's much more about making the mind a beautiful place. And then we start to notice whether the breath is long or short, first of all. So this is the first sort of steps in Anapanasati, um, to notice whether the breath is long or short. And it doesn't matter which, you know, it's, it's not the point, but it's just to give us something to grab our interest, something to be aware of that's, you know, a little bit more um, captivating of our attention. So we start to notice whether it's long or short, and that is called uh, initial attention, vitaka. It's one of the first jhana factors. It's not jhana. <laughs> you need all five, and even that's not jhana. <laughs> um, but it's the initial attention that sometimes is with the breath, and then it goes away again, right? Or we could say the breath sometimes comes in, and then the breath goes away again. So the mind's aware of it sporadically, and we keep directing the mind there, or we keep receiving the breath there. And then the next stage is when that uh, awareness becomes more sustained, so instead of just knowing whether the breath is long or short, we start to be able to experience the whole breath. So instead of the breath being like this, and then you notice it there, and then it comes back, and maybe you notice it, I don't know, after the next one or the next one, you start to experience the whole thing. And the mind kind of starts to almost like surf with that breath. It flows with that breath. And that breath starts to fill the mind. It fills the perception. And it even becomes a place where the mind can figuratively rest. So it becomes this very nice, gentle flow. And gradually, on its own, calms down. Yeah? So the calming, again, is not a doing. Yeah? So it's not that first we breathe long and short on purpose, and then, <laughs> and then we notice the whole breath with all our might. It's something that happens naturally. So it's more descriptive than a prescriptive um, set of yeah, descriptions, right? So it's more describing something that happens quite naturally. And then, yeah, as the mind gets more settled on that breath, it naturally starts to need, the body starts to need less oxygen. So the breath becomes calmer, yeah? And when it becomes calm, it's, it requires a more subtle kind of mindfulness. So the mindfulness has to kind of brighten up to a degree, or, or soften, you could say, to become even more refined, so that it can really keep that subtle object in mind. And the doing kind of energy subsides and gives way to more energy flowing into the knowing part of the mind. Yeah? So the receiving part of the mind, the knowing part of the mind, the mindfulness basically gets stronger. And so we start to notice more and more of the breath. And again, you know, if we try and calm that mind down or calm that breath down on our own, it just stirs things up again because we're getting involved. So it's just about allowing everything to settle. And then the next part is probably, as I said, the most important, which is the joy part of breath meditation. And this comes as a result of that increase in mindfulness. You know, it's uh, easy to be mindful of coarse objects, right? Some people are maybe, I don't know, their minds are kind of coarser and they need a lot of excitement to feel a sense of happiness or a thrill. But when you become, I don't know, an old nun, I guess, <laughs> you become quite boring. And you find happiness in little things, you know, very simple things that other people would say, what? There's nothing there. But of course, that's really great because then you need less. You don't have to go so far. You don't have to travel all over the world and climb the Himalayas like I used to do. <laughs> nothing wrong with it, but you just don't need it anymore. And so at this stage, you start to find joy in the simplest of things. And that's a direct result of the mindfulness increasing. So mindfulness is like energy, right? It's like the lights going up in the mind. And when the mind is energized and bright and aware, then we can see the joy in things we couldn't see it in before. 
sometimes because we're looking for the wrong kind of happiness. We're looking for something closer to sensuality, sensual pleasure. But after a while, that happiness of letting go, the happiness of you know, just having a very simple object in mind starts to really build up. And uh, there was one experience I had on a retreat a few years ago where all this bliss started to come up with the breath quite by itself. I had actually pretty much stopped trying to look at any particular object in my meditation and was just keeping my mind very still, very accepting. And all this joy started to suddenly arise. And it lasted several days. And I remember one day going out, just because it's my habit, to go out and walk in nature. And I couldn't really get very far because there was this sort of dam, only a very small dam. Some people call it a lake and I laugh at them because it's like it's a dam. <laughs> but this day I thought, wow, I was like captivated by it. And it was so kind of beautiful that it was enough. I stood there five minutes and it was like, enough. I, I, I want to get back to my breath. And the other interesting experience was that I took a piece of chocolate. And normally I really like dark chocolate. <laughs> and, uh, but there was so much joy in the mind. I'm not quite sure. Again, I think it was just habit that I thought I liked chocolate, so I'd take a piece. But it was kind of like almost obscuring the bliss in the mind. Because it was just like stimulating the tongue that didn't need to be stimulated at that time. There was already so much satisfaction in the mind that I realized why the Buddha says that um, sense restraint or like, let's say, lessening sense input gives a kind of unblemished happiness because it's kind of not pulling the happiness outside into the objects of the world. It's like allowing it to build from within. And that was really interesting to me. All I wanted to do was just sit and be, and be with myself, be with the breath. And uh, of course, it didn't last forever, but it lasted quite a number of days and uh, it's so interesting when these things happen you know and you start to get a different sense of what happiness is so yeah that was really the happiness of abandoning and it was a very natural process as the breath meditation should be so this is not to kind of stimulate desire or any of that because the minute the even in that experience the minute that the mind kind of gets out its hand so to speak and goes what's this the minute that happens, the bliss seems to recede. So, you know, if you're actually grabbing for things like that, they're never going to come to you. It's like if you're trying to grab those birds, they're not going to come into the room. <laughs> no matter how many knots you put out for them, right? They're not going to come. So even thinking that that might be something nice is, is actually going the other way in a sense. But we have to just notice the happiness of simple things at first, just like a simple breath. So... I wanted to just, I'm thinking of the time, yeah, just quickly mention uh, a question that came to me during the New Year retreat that I taught was that what happens if you get to this stage of breath meditation and the joy is not coming up? So what do we do at that time? And this is a really important question because obviously we're meant to wait and not force things and yet at the same time we can sometimes get stuck in a kind of, uh, on a sort of plateau or even in a dead end where the mind doesn't brighten up any further and it doesn't experience that joy. And I think, you know, what I would answer to that is that, again, the preparations may not be strong enough. So look at your lifestyle outside meditation, you know, go back to that and see other areas of your life that you're not really practicing yet in accordance with the Buddha's teaching, you know, other areas where you're still um, likely to say unskillful words or do unskillful things. Maybe there's company that you're keeping that is sort of taking you the wrong way. Um, and maybe, you know, those five hindrances are there. Most of the time, that's the, the thing. So it's important to identify which of those hindrances is your weakness. And I would guess that for many of us, it's usually ill will, which can manifest as just boredom, restlessness, um, a subtle kind of uh, not really thinking you deserve the happiness in meditation, yeah? not really thinking you're ready for it or you've done enough work, <laughs> this can be the other side of preparing the mind. 
we don't think we're ready, so we don't deserve it yet. And, you know, maybe it's dangerous. And for that, you know, again, loving kindness meditation, even if it's not your main practice, to practice some loving kindness every day. You know, when you wake up or before you go to bed, if you have a regular practice, you could practice meditation, metta meditation at the end of each sitting, for example. But just make it as a regular practice because over time it really does start to change the inclination of the mind from inclining to that ill will and maybe those thoughts of self-criticism, self-judgment, to much more charitable thoughts. So some people sometimes say, you know, how can I fit meditation into my life? And I was talking with Venerable Pekka the other day and we were saying, well, how about how can I fit my life into my meditation? <laughs> That's a much better question, isn't it? It's like, how can we actually align everything we do in our lives with the goal of the path? Because if we can do that, we have an integrated practice and, you know, no, nothing we do goes waste. Whatever activity you're involved in, it can be right speech, right action, right livelihood, you know, or it can be establishing right intentions. So really, there's no situation in which we cannot respond to with loving kindness, compassion, and letting go. You know, we can always be kind. We can always be more gentle. And we can always kind of make peace with whatever arises, yeah? So we're not trying to look for some special experience, but we're trying to learn to relate to life in a much wiser way. And lastly, I think, uh, is just to learn not to reject suffering too quickly but to see even suffering or, you know, disappointment, I don't know, irritation as an opportunity to grow. And, uh, yeah, Venerable Upeka again was sharing with me a story. Is it okay to say it's your father? Yeah, too late. <laughs> so he's been going through some, yeah, some difficult times. There's been some... Uh, things that have been difficult for him and uh, until then you were telling me that he was sort of enjoying playing the piano and writing articles for the Guardian which are you know lovely things to do I'm sure but you know he was being a little bit complacent about the Dhamma practice and being a born Buddhist I think he probably knew he should get into the practice a bit more but it was only really when you know something challenging arose in his life that he realized okay I do need to make this my priority I do need to focus more on the, on the practice. And it's really beautiful to hear about how the family sort of chant together, meditate together, listen to Dhamma talks, probably not always together. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're really uh, supporting that. And he, as a consequence, is getting wiser and getting more confidence in the practice. So sometimes it's that suffering. For me, that was the case, that it was, you know, feeling, yeah, I don't know, like, everybody says I shouldn't be suffering, but I just feel this weight of the world on my shoulders at such a young age. And, and you know, that really was the cause for me to find a spiritual path, for me to search for something more than what society could present to me as my options. And so, you know, don't reject that. See that as a possibility to grow in wholesome ways. And everything becomes, as my teacher says, mango, no, manure for the mango tree. <laughs> Actually, he doesn't say that word, but anyway, I'm being polite. <laughs> so if you can dig it in to your heart, you know, don't kind of roll in it, because then you really will stink. But, you know, don't just chuck it out either and see if there's some wisdom there to be found.